People often ask me how I decide what to read next, how I find new books and authors. And for me, I suspect it's like for most people, it's a combination of what one hears recommended by other people along with things that one already has an interest in. For me in particular, the views and analyses of other readers plays a really big role. Most of the time, I'm not reading something as soon as it comes out, primarily because availability might not be immediate, awareness might be non-existent or lagging behind but also because I really like to wait and see what others have to say about certain things. This obviously doesn't apply to favorite creators or things that I'm anticipating for a long time, which as the years go by, gradually gets bigger and bigger. So there's a lot more, I think, as you get more confident in your reading and who you like, there's a lot more that you can trust your own instincts on where you say that I've got to try that out and I'm going to read that no matter what. But there's always, especially because there's so much good stuff being published and there's so much not so great stuff being published at the same time, there's always a real value for me to wait and listen to what gets a certain kind of critical or at least passionate following because I think that lets me know that my chances are higher in trying something worthwhile and I wouldn't be wasting my time and money. But there's another side to this critical acclaim thing. Very often it has happened, or at least it's happened often enough with me that I've read something that a lot of people have raved about and I've just not been moved in the same way. I'm sure all of you have had this experience, which means that when something gets reviewed through the roof or when something is acclaimed by every person you hear talk about it or by most people you hear talk about it, I also start getting a little worried that it's actually going to be a letdown for me. This balance between giving into the excitement and the anticipation of something that is very well spoken about and the danger on the other hand of being let down by hype or by uh, people getting carried away in your opinion is what makes approaching well-reviewed works of the past such an interesting prospect. In today's video, I'd like to talk about two such books that have been widely acclaimed that I've finally gotten around to reading. These are Mr. Miracle, written by Tom King and with art and colors by Mitch Gerards, and Plastic Man, Rubber Banded, written, penciled, inked, lettered, and colored by Kyle Baker. I got and read both of these in their deluxe hardcover editions from DC Comics, with the Plastic Man Deluxe Edition featuring this thick rubber band. Mr. Miracle is from 2017, 2018, and the Plastic Man stories over here are from earlier, from 2004 or 2005, I believe. And both of them are lauded and celebrated runs. So did they live up to or surpass the hype, or did they fall short? Let me tell you what I thought about Mr. Miracle and Plastic Man. When I was younger, my enthusiasm for superheroes was completely based on the character. If it was Spider-Man, I'm reading it. If it's someone else that I'm less familiar with or less enamored with, I'm less interested. And then it was the crossovers that got me to discover new superheroes. I read Daredevil because Daredevil appeared in Spider-Man, for example. But over the years, I think like many people, my interest in superheroes became more about the creators involved in particular stories and particular runs. And given my disinterest in the long convoluted continuities of the big two Marvel and DC superheroes, I tended to focus more on the one and done standalone reads or at the most a couple of volumes to give me a complete story rather than something that required me to read uh, issue after issue in a serial form or to know about a deep lore in order to appreciate it. Which is why when I first heard about Tom King and and uh, Gabriel Walter's The Vision, I was so intrigued. It seemed like something that I may not enjoy because it seemed to have a direct connection to the current Marvel storylines. But at the same time, I was told that it was a very independently readable piece of storytelling, something that had seriousness and pathos. And everything I heard about it 
sounded intriguing. When I did read The Vision, I thought it was an excellent story. I was quite impressed with how little I needed to know about the larger Marvel Universe, while at the same time I could see that there was a lot of Easter eggs or a lot of references that fans could enjoy, but none of that really took away from the reading pleasure for someone who had very little or no idea about these things. At the same time, I thought it was quite an accomplished, if a bit somber take on on the superhero genre. It felt very much like a Greek tragedy and me enjoying the vision so much got me interested when I started hearing about how good Tom King's Mr. Miracle was. Mr. Miracle would also feature the art of Mitch Gerards whose collaboration with Tom King in The Sheriff of Babylon was another comic series that I really enjoyed. The Sheriff of Babylon, I felt, was a very well-written and a very well-drawn comic, which told a gripping story full of memorable characters and really sold me on Tom King. This is what got me interested in reading what else he had to offer. But he was writing Batman, and I hadn't read Batman in many years, and I didn't want to get into a continuity series, which is why Mr. Miracle sounded right up my alley. It was a limited series with a finite story that should work as a standalone, at least that's the impression I got. The fact that I waited for a deluxe hardcover instead of going for the TPB shows that I already expected it to be very good and something worth keeping and something worth having in a fancy edition. At the same time, I have to admit that somewhere in the back of my mind, I was a little worried about maybe not liking this and maybe being one of the few people who wouldn't think this is a superb masterpiece. I've always admired Jack Kirby, but perhaps more from the role that he plays in the history of comics than an outright love for all of the comics that he published, especially the fourth world comics out of which Mr. Miracle comes. Uh, Mr. Miracle was invented by Kirby alongside a whole bunch of these new gods. And honestly, I'm not very familiar with the entire new gods mythology. I'm not familiar with how they've been used by DC subsequent to the Kirby stories. I never finished reading all of the Kirby stories and I definitely haven't read them since then. And the fact that this mini series would plumb the depths of that mythos was frankly a little intimidating for me. So when I finally read this now, I was first and foremost impressed with how readable this is for someone who knows absolutely nothing about Mr. Miracle or the fourth world or the new gods or any of that. A small part of the credit definitely goes to a brief introduction in comics form written by Tom King and drawn by Mike Norton, which gives the backstory of the New Gods mythology in a very concise form, but also with language and themes that will come up in the main story. I don't think this introductory comic was part of the initial single issues run. I believe it's something created for the collected editions, but it works wonderfully to give you just the important little bits that you need to know in order to understand the story that comes later. The story itself is something I found quite gripping. It was unexpectedly serious. I think I should say it was expectedly serious after Sheriff of Babylon and The Vision. I think I expected Tom King to take a much more mature uh, approach to the subject matter, by which I don't mean sex and violence, but by studying the psyche and studying trauma and pain and damage the way that he has in his earlier works. And Mr. Miracle didn't let me down on that front. From the very beginning, a bit of a content warning on self-harm, it starts with a suicide attempt by Scott Free. Mr. Miracle. And the rest of the story does live in the shadow of that attempt, although it's not quite what you think it is. In fact, not what you think it is, is sort of the central running theme of these 12 issues. This is one of the most unique mainstream superhero comics I've read recently, maybe one of the most unique mainstream superhero comics I've ever read, given its fascination with both the epic and the mundane, but the kind of painful examination of how separate they are and where they coincide. Mr. Miracle and his wife, Big Barda, are super-powered beings. They are the new gods or among the new gods, but they're also a married couple. And 
parts of the story are almost painful indie movie analyses of marriage and domesticity. Other parts of it seem to be all about deflating superhero epic notions and yet other parts of it are exactly what you would expect big bombastic space science fiction to be but always with this edge and this shadow or this undercurrent of pain running through it. At the same time along with this seriousness and pain and this kind of examination another Another thing that I really appreciated about the series was the fact that it's actually quite funny. In fact, I would think that almost half the issues of the series or half the pages of many issues of the series are given over to a particular type of comedy that both revels in lampooning certain things and in celebrating things in superhero comics in a way that I found to be utterly charming and often laugh out loud funny. I honestly did not expect to be laughing at something that starts like this or something that had this kind of reputation and the fact that King and Gerard could marry that comedy with the level of seriousness and with the level of uh, reality bending, self-questioning uh, analysis that this book otherwise has. The fact that that comedy could link up to this as effortlessly as it does is one of the most impressive things about this series. Honestly, I don't have much to criticize in this. I'm not sure if I'm the intended audience because there are probably dozens and dozens of Easter eggs and references that I don't get, but I also understand that these things over here that could possibly be Easter eggs are also playing a very important part of this story, which is what I always like about the best Easter eggs or the best fan service is they're not just thrown in there as a cosmetic, what I would consider a cheap ploy to get uh, people to enjoy what you're doing, but it's crafted with enough complexity to say it works if you know nothing about them. If it works just to see uh, two men uh, involved in peace negotiations, you can see that as a political satire. You can see that as a commentary on the way powerful nations behave and things like that, you can also think of these as familiar characters that you've known for generations being put across in a new light. I think it works so well in both ways and together that I found myself very impressed by something that may not actually be written for me. Much has been made of the nine panel grid structure used in this comic and what has been probably most famously used in Watchmen. And for me, the claustrophobia of that form and the sort of incessant focus on one moment being broken down into all these slices work really well for this trauma and depression soaked story. And the very same structure creates a number of different effects. In one chapter in particular, I was reminded almost of uh, Windsor McKay's Little Nemo, which is an attack sequence that Mr. Miracle and Big Barda are doing on Apocalypse, but the conversation they're having is about rearranging their house and what needs to change and the reason why sort of unfolds as the battle is climaxing as their attack is getting closer and closer to the end. And the fact that these nine panels were giving me this almost everyday conversation against this dreamlike movement of violence was quite Quite a remarkable sequence and a good example of how bold and entertaining this comic is at the same time. So although I had both high expectations and a little bit of trepidation coming into reading Mr. Miracle, I am happy to report that I absolutely love this series. I don't know if I'll be reading it again uh, very soon. It does take a little bit of its uh, toll on you, but because of its lighter touches, because of its playfulness, and because of the brilliance, I think, that is evident in the writing and the art and the wonderful way they work together, to me, this was a book absolutely worth waiting for a nice hardcover edition of, and I have no doubt that I'll be returning to it sometime in the future. An older series, but a newer publication from the deluxe edition of King and Gerard's Mr. Miracle is Plastic Man, Rubber Banded, the deluxe edition by Kyle Baker. Kyle Baker's run on Plastic Man in the early 2000s is a stuff of legend. It is widely acclaimed from what little I've read about on the internet and what people have told me as one of the best superhero runs in mainstream comics there is. And that's particularly interesting because it was such a short run. There are only 18 issues that Kyle Baker did. This recently published deluxe edition fills a long-standing gap 
in the availability of this series. I had read a couple of issues of this, which at the time struck me as very odd and very unique uh, all ages approach to a superhero story. But I never got to read much more of that, which is what makes this a book that I was waiting for for a long time. I'm a fan of what else I've read by Kyle Baker, which admittedly is not much. And I was particularly impressed by his Nat Turner, which I praised in one of my shelf videos. But not having read one of the books that he's most famous for in mainstream comics felt like an injustice. But again, like Mr. Miracle, I love the creator and had heard a lot about this series that I knew was supposed to be excellent but I had my reservations as well and that's because in my limited DC comics reading Plastic Man has never really seemed to work in all the superhero team up stories including Grant Morrison's Justice League he's never seemed to quite work with the sort of somber and self-serious superheroes you have even when he's played for comedic relief which seems like the most obvious way to use him in those groups it seems always to me a little jarring and something doesn't quite work I always thought that his own series in which the entire world works the way that he does and an entire cast of characters suited to that tone would be more like what I would expect from a character like Plastic Man. At the same time, I have checked out a couple of stories by original Plastic Man creator Jack Cole, someone I was introduced to in the pages of The Spirit by Will Eisner. And I found those stories to be very unique and very strange and very odd for the time that they were published. So given this push and pull of how this character has been portrayed and worked for me, as well as the talent of Kyle Baker involved, I was very intrigued in how I would react to this deluxe edition. The production certainly didn't hurt. A very handsome hardcover with a wonderful matte finish and this pièce de résistance rubber band putting it all together gets you started on uh, the right foot, making you feel that this is something worth all this special effort and this idiosyncratic packaging. And once again, I was extremely pleased to find the content living up to the kind of reverence and effort that has gone into the packaging. These stories are pure silly joy. They're rapid fire chaotic like Looney Tunes and they have a lot of sarcastic and a lot of slight remarks about police procedurals and superhero stories, but all done with a tongue-in-cheek warmth and affection that I found absolutely charming. Among the impressive things in these three stories by Kyle Baker are the fact that each of them is distinct in tone, style, and subject matter while still being very, very distinct distinctly different from anything else you've seen in superhero comics. He uses slightly different art styles that evoke children's illustration, animation from Saturday morning cartoons, and other things in order to tell three stories that I think increase in complexity, starting with a basic origin story and establishing of relationships and characters to things that are more experimental and a little more out there. At the same time, it's unquestionably all ages and quite uniquely all ages in a way that I don't think I've encountered. By which I mean, I think there are at least three distinct ways to read this story and a fourth one in which you can read them all together. You can look just at the artwork, read no text at all, and I think this is something that even a five-year-old or a six-year-old would enjoy. It's pure cartoony goodness, stretching the form, uh, pun absolutely intended, to beautiful, ridiculous levels. It's gloriously silly, and you're always very, very clear about what's going on. He fell flat on his face, he got pulled through a fan, he's masquerading as a boat that sprung a leak. Whatever it may be, it's absolutely clear, even when you're in the midst of some absolute chaos and some absolute madcapery. At the second level, you can read rather silly text, things that have puns and little jokes thrown into them, little reactions that are as gag-filled, although maybe a little less successfully than the visual gags, but still 
very very gag filled text the third level would be a more grown up and inside joke type of approach in which references are made to superheroes to dc universe to superhero continuities and it may not be alan moore or grant morrison but there's definitely a lot of self aware construction going on in these stories if you put them all together you can choose at different times to read this sort of postmodern dissection along inside this ridiculous cartoony violence uh, that you are seeing on the page and that creates a unique effect or you can take the silly puns and the animated cartoonish to make it purely a children's television show or you can have a mixed reaction to it like watching looney tunes or jim henson's puppet shows in the introduction of this book Kyle Baker does say that he was left alone to do whatever he wanted and you can absolutely believe it when you read these stories they seem madcap and anarchic but but also innocent and warm not cruel and sly the way that some anarchy in comics can be in a way that feels absolutely untouched by committee or marketing oriented ways of creating humorous content these days when a lot of the corporate storytelling we see seems absolutely cookie cutter and washed plain as if you've just seen the thing over and over again looking at something like this and reading these kind of stories is a very unique and peculiar joy there's a sort of unbridled glee in these pages which coupled with that absolute lack of meanness that makes it some of the most wholesome silly stuff you'll ever read I'm really happy to have all of Kyle Baker's Plastic Man comics finally collected and I'm really happy that they're as good if not better than I was led to believe. Both of these books prove to me that the hype is sometimes real and reinforce to me why listening to other people's advice and listening to other people's recommendations can be such a wonderful and joyous experience. If you've read either of these comics, I'd love to know what you think. If you've avoided reading them, I'd love to know why. If you didn't like them, if you like them leave it all in the comments below this has been for the love of comics thank you as always for watching and i'll see you at the next video